I see a picture like this, and I don't know if yeah, I'm standing in the right spot. Yeah, I think this I just, is. I was looking at it. I, was like, I hey, feel like I should get down next? on my knees and talk, actually, but I'm not going to. Um, yeah. When you see a picture like this in Facebook, um, what do you think? Well, I am a professional, right? So what I do is I look at one thing. I look at that number, and that number, three thousand. And I think, really? Does somebody really have three thousand friends? I mean, who are you kidding? Um, but you know what I do, actually? I do have 3,000 friends. Um, actually, I have more than that, but it doesn't matter. So, um, <laughs> but, but how is it that we went from having, when we considered friends, we're, we're like um, uh, our friends and our family, and there was maybe 100 or 200 and maybe 300, and that we made that leap so quickly to 3,000. How did that happen? Like, what's going on here, right? Um, well, this is what happens when I take my network on LinkedIn and I ask them to visualize it. And what it says is, wow, that's one large network. <laughs> and what that means is they can't even visualize it because it's too big. So that says a lot of things. This is, a, I think, a, um, a very interesting phenomenon. And um, uh, I have to look at my notes here. So what this tells me is that um, we've It's really important because what it means is if I really treat these people as my friends, if these 3,000 people I think of as friends that I'm in contact with on a regular basis for the rest of my life, it means that they are one click away when I need them. And that if my friends are networked and they've got 100 friends or 1,000 friends or 5,000 friends, then I'm like a two or three clicks away from that many people. Now, you don't want to press them into service necessarily so quickly, but you can if you need to. And that has a profound influence on culture. It's really changing everything that's going on. So this next view that I love is, um, that feels, feels like my travel schedule recently, but it's actually not. It's actually the, um, <laughs> the network activity on couchsurfing.com. So couchsurfing is this remarkable community where people are lending their couches, their guest rooms, their houses to strangers. So that same transitive property of friends where I've gone from 300 people that are my friends to 3,000 people I consider my friends. So you've got couchsurfing and you've got this, this community of 5 million people in 97,000 countries, uh, cities around the globe in every single country, and these people are opening up their homes to perfect strangers. What I think is that generosity is not just for friends and family anymore. That this whole concept, these things like couch surfing, and these things like Kickstarter, and these things like, like ride sharing and buzz car, these are all companies that are, their underlying basis is generosity. People are sharing their most intimate objects, their cars, their homes, their time, their self, they're sharing them with people that they don't even know. They're trusting these systems that are being built. And these systems are part of the underlying um, cultural infrastructure that's being built for these changes that are happening. So generous, generosity is not just for friends anymore. How, did, um, how does this happen? Well, I think we have to go back for a minute to what it was like yesterday or a couple of years ago, or 10 years ago, which was that we lived in a really ordered world. We lived in a world where people could have, on the average, two jobs over their lifetime, and that things were predictable, and that felt good, and it felt safe, and you believed that your company was gonna take care of you, and you believed that you could tend to your family, and you could tend to um, your community, and that was just fine. And then you know what? Everything changed. And there's all kinds of reasons why things changed. Um, we could get into them, but I'm not going to because you guys know it's the economics and, and generational challenges. And, and um, the world has really changed. And it's not going to go back to that ordered way. And we're not going to have those kind of predictable lives and the predictable careers that we had in the past. So, but what we do have, um, and some of these forces that are making this what I'm going to argue about in a minute, this sort of beta world. Um, we do have something interesting happening, which is 42 million Americans, according to Freelancers Union, describe themselves as freelancers. And another 44 million, according to Richard, Richard Florida, describe themselves as cultural creatives. And 
one of the ways that they distinguish themselves is that they say, you know what, I am a um, freelancer, I am an independent, I am not beholden to any kind of an institution, and I am an entrepreneur. So we hear this a lot, there's a lot of talk about entrepreneurism, and you wonder what kind of entrepreneurs or what's happening to entrepreneurship if, if everybody's beginning to think about themselves as an entrepreneur. When I think of the beginning of entrepreneurship, I look at this particular slide, and we all recognize it. It's you know the, the homage of the dent here. So these guys in their garage, the rest of the world is thinking, what's this place, Silicon Valley? Who are these guys, right? And they think they're inventing the future. Um, and it just didn't seem real. It didn't seem like it was possible that some guys might be doing something that was going to have a profound impact on my life if my life was really predictable and I had a couple of jobs over my lifetime and things didn't change and I was maybe working for the same company that my father worked for or that my grandfather worked for. Um, but you know what, everything did change. And um, the interesting thing about these guys as entrepreneurs is that as it rose over the last several decades, as you begin to see the entrepreneur being highlighted more and more in the media, and you begin to see the, the heroism or the heroic light of the entrepreneur. So what you see is people like this. And the reason why I love looking at people like this is that you know I look at them and I think, oh, wait a minute. They look like me, or they look like my kid, or they look like my friends, or they look like someone I'd like to know. Um, and they're creating all these amazing companies. And they're doing things like no evil, or at least they're trying to do things like no evil. And that this is so exciting to me because not only is it, is it transforming the economy, but it's igniting this cultural imagination. And as I'm thinking about igniting the cultural imagination, you're thinking, hey, if they can do it, I can do it. And how do I, as a person who is a freelance person or as a person who is a cultural creative person, how do I get in on this stuff? Okay, this is one of my favorite quotes that a client of mine almost 20 years ago, so it's 1995, I'm working as a headhunter in New York, Candace Carpenter had the um, startup media company in New York and she was quoted in the New York Times saying this. And everyone was like, oh my God, how can this be? What do you mean anything worth doing is worth doing badly? At that time, you wouldn't even think about doing something unless you could do it brilliantly. So this idea of anything worth doing was worth doing badly was just heresy. And yet, I would argue that that's the beginning, or that's the kind of thinking that we have now. Maybe not quite so extreme, but certainly in the case of saying almost anything is worth trying. And that becomes a bit of the mantra of what I call the beta mindset. And the beta mindset are the betapreneurs. So what is beta betapreneurship and what does a betapreneur look like? So you're going to see all these slides. I may as well say they probably look pretty young. Um, and often they are. And if they're not young, they've got a young, flexible mindset. So that includes everybody in this room. And they are most likely independent. And they identify as creative and they're interested in culture. Um, and if they're not a freelancer, they're going to become one as soon as their idea takes off and they can quit their day job. And they talk about their passion a lot because these businesses start from passion. Um, but they don't really talk about money because money is really not so much a primary motivator for them. And they talk about community a lot because that's important to them. And they talk about um, lots of things. One of the other interesting things about these, about these betapreneurs is that they are characterized by three things. I've been trying to figure out how you would describe them. And the three things that I've distilled down that you can kind of remember and, and you'll be able to spot them as the, you come across certain kinds of people here and think, is this a betapreneur? Is this a betapreneur? Is this a betapreneurial business? Um, so first of all, they don't sit around and do a 100-page business plan and they don't take six months to try to figure out their strategy and they may not even have a path to monetization. But you know what? They just start. They just jump right in. They get to it. So they put a product out and they hear from their community or their network what they, what they think about it, and then they put another product out. Or they try another sandwich of the food truck. Or they try another, an, another way of visualizing the, the, the clothing that they are designing. Because the betapreneurs are in all these different areas because they're really transforming all kinds of businesses. They're not just in what we would think of as the computer-based or the IT-based businesses. So first they just start, they just get to it, or like Nike, they just do it. Um, 
Other thing that's really important is that they see failure differently. They've got a different lens on it. And I think part of that comes from that just do it, to sort of jump in and try and do, is that rather than spending months and months or years developing something and putting it lovingly out into the marketplace and assuming that you've made all the right choices, um, and if it doesn't work, then it is devastating when it's a failure. But they don't do that because they just jump in and they try and they iterate and they try again um, and they keep reworking until what they're doing catches on or doesn't. They see failure quite differently. Um, so it's not so devastating and part of that is looking at the Silicon Valley culture, which is an engineering based culture, so failure is baked into it. They don't even think about it as failure. And the other part is looking at artists and the creative process and understanding that that is an iterative process as well. So they don't think about failure in the same way that like a lot of business people think about failure. And lastly, this whole community and the network <coughs> that we've been talking about, they're completely and totally community oriented. They know that their community, they're going to have to live and die by it. So that original number that I had, the 3,000 people who are the, my Facebook friends, um, these people know how important it is to take care of their community and to feed their community and their networks because they're going to put their products out there, they're going to put their services out there, and they're going to hear back from their community members what, what they like about it and what they don't, what worked, what didn't. I don't like it this way, but if you try it, I actually like it that way. And you begin to find, find your feet with all of this intensive feedback that you get. So what do some of these betapreneurial businesses look like? I've got a few here, and there's many, many more that I've been working with over the last 10 years. So we've got the Clover food trucks. So we've got um, Ian Muir, who was an MIT grad, who wanted to start a, um, a chain of healthy food restaurants in, um, in, in the US. And rather than going about it saying, OK, I'm going to hire a chef, and I'm going to do all kinds of testings, and we're going to have all kinds of focus groups, and we're going to have some expensive real estate in a place and see how this works. What he did was he just dove in, or basically just drove in. He set up the Clover food truck on the MIT campus. He started with the menus and growing it, and who liked what and who didn't like it. So the menu grew from the most popular items. And he ditched the things that didn't work. And he continually iterates. He's in contact with his passionate group of customers who tell him what they love very vocally. And he's now got three more trucks. He's doing a whole series of, um, of physical restaurants and on his way to being a healthy food chain in the US, keeping in touch with people all along the way in his community. But he started it quite differently. And any step along the way could have pivoted and could have played. Uh, craft work is another one that I love. So if you're a designer and you're working on a prototyping and you want to have something manufactured, it used to be you'd have to go to find a factory or go offshore, but now you can just take your design files and you can upload them up to Craftwork and they will find the best printer to print out, and printing I mean manufacture, whatever you have designed. Uh, love square f your square feet com, which is an aggregator of retail space in the San Francisco area. And what that means is you can rent a space on the ground level, retail, for only a day if you want, a day, a week, a month, however long you want. And what this means, as a betapreneur, you can try pretty much anything you want. You, you want to try a performance? OK, one night, two nights. You want to try a restaurant? Try it for a week. But it allows you to bypass all of the onerous things that would slow down an idea to see you can move much more quickly through the process. So like everything, I mean, in the US, we're a lot more pirates than we are farmers. And the big uh, companies have been sort of catting to and get, catching on to this whole betapreneurial thinking. So you've got P&G. They have their, um, their, their vocal point, which is 500,000 moms who are engaged with their product development, who are getting their samples, who are every day telling P&G what they think about it. Their friends are trying, and they're getting back. And you know nobody's more vocal than a mom to tell you what you should do better and what you shouldn't do better. So, so they've, got, they've got a tiger by the tail with vocal point. And then you've got Staples. They have a, um, a, a competition for you want to create the next new office product. Great. If we like it and use it, develop it, you get a $25,000 check. And there are about several of these uh, 
these items that have been picked up. And GE recently did crowdsourcing of an energy challenge for the grid, and they had hundreds of submissions, and they are now in the process of, of actually funding a number of what they thought were the most interesting. So this whole beta mindset is, is moving into the uh, large corporations. Um, so you might think, okay, is this like a passing fad? Like, you know, is this, is this really sustainable or not? And, and uh, I've had the great pleasure of being involved with Kickstarter, which is uh, one of these transformational beta, beta entrepreneurial businesses. And, and uh, let me tell you, it's, it's really sustainable. It's um, to the tune of $319 million pledged. Um, strangers pledged to support um, either their friends or people they don't know, projects, creative projects that they think are interesting. For virtually nothing in return, I mean, maybe you can get an advanced commerce, but for the most part, it's supporting along for the ride. And one of the amazing things, getting back to the idea about these networks and about the community, um, in, the, in the involvement with Kickstarter, what I've seen is people come for the money because they need to raise the money, and they're blown away by the community. They're blown away by the engagement and the support that happens in the community. So, again, is this, is this a passing fad? I don't think so. I think it's really more of a tectonic shift that's happening. And you might think, okay, you know what? I think I'm going to maybe I'm going to sit this one out. I kind of I like this idea, but you know, I've got bigger fish to fry. I really want to I'm going to I'm looking for the next big thing. I've got to see something that's really scalable and big. Um, and I would argue that there's not a tremendous amount of investment to be able to begin to kind of play in this betapreneur world. Um, it's a really fun place to play. There's three things you might want to consider, and they're easy. So this first one is that you got to get outside of your world. You've got to get over yourself. You're probably not the smartest person around. There are a lot of other people that have different kinds of intelligence that would be really interesting to you if you were open to that. So first thing, get out of your world. Open yourself up. Second thing is you can't do this alone. These are not, the, evaluating and understanding entrepreneurs and their ideas and their businesses, it's very hard to do alone. So this is when you need to press your network. You need to press them into service. You need to ask for help, whether it's something on your own that you're doing or whether you're evaluating working with someone or whether you're just wanting to help along the way because it feels good to help. Press your network into service. That makes it fun, and these are, these are very hard things to evaluate in a traditional way. And thirdly, most importantly, I think you've got to listen. And not only do you have to listen, but you need to listen without judgment. Because the, these betapreneurs and this thinking, they're nuanced and they're subtle and they're sometimes really hard to pick up on the cues. And if you are quick to judge and tell them what they should or they shouldn't do, um, often they'll shut down or they'll just think you don't get it because probably you don't. And it's really important to be able to listen carefully and give their ideas the kind of respect that you want people to give your, your own ideas. Um, and you're likely to pick up on some interesting ideas, but you know you don't have to say, oh my God, that's crazy, or that will never work, oh, it's completely undoable. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't, but don't shut it out. Listen and be generous with your listening. I spent a lot of time in many, many years looking for who was going to be the next, the next big entrepreneur, what was going to be the next big thing, what was this shift that was happening earlier today when Avi was talking about, about following Moore's Law, and I love that as being an organizing principle to try to figure out what's next. Um, so about 10 years ago, I stopped doing that. I was like, you know what, I'm not, I don't care about that anymore. I'm just going to, I'm going to come along, I'm going to get into this flow of this transition from from how this entrepreneurship, how this kind of beta thinking is moving out into the world of, of culture and is changing all the world around us. And I'm going to be really generous with my time and with my contacts because I think that that's what's needed right now. And it's been great because along the way, um, I stopped looking for the big fish and actually I found one of the great big next things and I got a chance to be involved with it. And I would argue that if you continue to look for it, good luck, maybe you will find it. And you know, there are all kinds of ways that, and people have their ways of trying to determine them, but there's such interesting, wonderful, textured things that are going on right now, and there's great transformational thinking that's happening right now, and it's really fun to be a part of. It's fun and it's a real privilege to be a part of. So I would also suggest that 
in this connection-based economy where networks rule and where generosity really matters, that there's no small parts. There's only small actors. And I don't want to be a small actor at all. And you can imagine that these betapreneurs and these remarkable, unusual, some very quirky ideas all might come together and amass to something that looks like a dent in our future. And it may be just that easy. Thank you. Anybody, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Right. Or we think it's devastating. Or we think it's devastating. Right. Socialized we think it's more devastating. Right. We think it's devastating if we're going to look at our notes, for example. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, so how, um, how do you see sort of the, the up and coming generation of female entrepreneurs entering things as, as part of that piece of Voyager? Is it, is it more popular? I'm kind of blown away. Yeah, I'm really blown away by it. I think I'm blown away by, by, that, by the entire generation, by the millennials. Um, and then by people sort of mid twenties into you know late thirties, the same thing. But particularly the millennials, there's a fierceness that I'm just in awe of. Um, and I think that that you know the the one of the comments that I made about about getting over yourself or getting out of your own way, that would be the thing that I would say mostly to the women, which is to say you don't have to be sexy, you don't have to be hot, you don't. If you know what, if you want to do a great job, just get into it and just go for that. I think we have so many competing interests that make it difficult for women um, to just go forward and do what they want. Um, and you know, we could we could talk about that for hours, and we probably should. But, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I'd be happy to. Any other questions here? In the front, I can't see anything. That's why I'm like going. Yes, yes, you. What's that? Oh, okay. Anybody who had their hand up? Anyone? No. No betapreneurs here. I bet some of you guys are working with them, or you started them, or you are them. Yes. I think they're amazing. I think, I think they're all part of this infrastructure that's going to make it work. And I think that works really well. And people te seem to think about these businesses um, as being ones that are sort of internet fueled, and often they are, or socially, social media fueled, as often they are. But some of those incubators are also, again, this is happening outside of that world. So you've got all these maker spaces that are happening, like MIT Resistor, and, and there's a bunch in California, and the whole maker movement where people are getting in and they're tinkering. That's all about beta, and great things are coming out of there. You're seeing it happening now in the, in the whole medical field. You're seeing things like GenSpace and Ubiome, and you're seeing all this DIY thinking, all this beta thinking that's going and that's really pushing. Um, and it's pushing because in so many ways, I think that the economy is we're really, um, we're really jammed up. And a lot of these businesses are jammed up, and they're tied up with regulation, and they're tied up with, with business models that, that, and distribution channels that are very different. So you know, if I think about my distribution channel being my 3,000 Facebook friends, that's pretty interesting and powerful. So you know, I've got to take care of them in a specific way. But, but I think the accelerators are super important. I think the maker spaces, I think all of these collectives are really important because it gives people a chance to, to really understand their community and really um, feed off of their community. And it's important because you can't do this alone. Then another question over here, yeah? No? Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.